Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon, where I talk about narrative film, television and in books. And today this is going to be looking at Dead House Gates, book two of the Malazan Book of the Fallen, from a series spoilers all perspective. From this moment on, full series spoilers. So if you haven't read To the End of the Crippled God, I will be referring to things uh, from that that alter your perspective of the book to Dead House Gates. So that being said, series all spoilers, let's talk about Dead House Gates from a reread perspective. Now, if we break down Dead House Gates, let's, let's look at a couple of, of key aspects. One is the theme of monstrosity. We find that there are numerous instances, the meeting with Miss Rembra, the meeting with Grillin, the, the whole path of Han's storyline. A lot of that is concerned with monstrous figures pursuing power. So we can see how that ties into something that Kamen Saad is interested in investigating from the point of view that he is very much perceived as a monster. And he's looking at how monsters are treated, how monsters pursue power. What, what is it that monsters do? What makes them monstrous? And part of the path of Han's storyline focuses very much on these questions. And then that ties in very much to what Carrium is doing and how Carrium is perceived. And of course, this is the, the major introduction of Carrium. We get the whole relationship between Mapo and Carrium. What makes someone care about someone else? All of these questions go to, is Carrium a monster? Can he still be loved? Is he worthy of love? Is he worthy of friendship? Can he have friendship? These are all questions to do with Icarium. And remember, through the whole storyline with Icarium, he is an amnesiac. He has uh, issues with rage, lashing out, destroying things all around him uncontrollably because of something he did in his past. So there is a balance between uh, Icarium being responsible for these things because, yes, he does them, the the situation that he got himself into, he created. But at the same time, when Icarium loses himself to his rage, is it still Icarium? Is it something else? And we can see how that question is very important to come and solve because he was torn from the heavens, broken into pieces, tortured, uh, in constant pain, and is lashing out at this cruel world. So how much of that is him as victim? And how much of that is him as evil perpetrator of destruction who is monstrous? This is a key question for Kamensod. And then we see that on a human scale with Felicin. We see how Felicin, through her treatment, she is a victim. She is placed in a situation by other people beyond her control. And she is subjected to degrading and um, monstrous acts. She is, she is tortured uh, physically and emotionally by these things. And she lashes out. And so it is almost testing this hypothesis. How much of that is Felsen's fault? Can we fault Felsen? Can we blame Felsen? And you only have to listen to some of the discussion on forums and some of the discussion about this book in particular to see how people react to the character of Felicit. And it, it goes between those two extremes that we should understand that she is an innocent victim. We should understand that she is not to be blamed for all of these things. But at the same time, she does act in reprehensible, aggressive ways. It's understandable why she and again, we have this balance, we have this question, and it's not that Kamen Sod is going, here is the answer. This is all about Kamen Sod exploring this. And so we can see how Felicin ties very neatly into this exploration of victimhood, monstrosity. Um, what is, can you still love and care for a character, even when they do destructive things, even when they act badly? And we see that almost uh, mirrored in the character of Bowden. Bowden is a monster. He is a murderer. He is an assassin. He is a spy. He is violent. He is brutal. And yet, he isn't all bad. He is sacrificing his life to protect 
Ellison, even though she's unaware of it and she doesn't like him, she doesn't want him, she tries to sabotage him, she tries to kill him. All of these things are the complex nuances of these relationships. And so we can see how that, even from a thematic or conceptual standpoint, is a key focus for what um, Kamensod is exploring in this novel. Now, another aspect, obviously, of Felicent's storyline is Felicent was put in this position by Tavor. And again, one of the central threads of what Kamensod is exploring in the series is trying to understand Tavor, trying to understand the mind of this human who has done all these things that ultimately results in freeing him, but he can't wrap his head around it. So he's examining Tavor through her impact, through her actions in the world, and trying to find out who she is, what makes her tick. And of course, this ties into, you know, Tavor had to make this decision in Dead House Gates because of Gano's parents' decision uh, in Gardens of the Moon. So we see how it flows from Gano's to Tavor and ultimately affects Felicin, that there's a continuity of consequence. And of course, that is something that Kamensaw is exploring, how there are consequences, foreseen and unforeseen consequences to actions, and trying to map these things out, trying to trace out how he ultimately ends up in the situation that he does, how Tavor ends up in that situation. What are the forces? What are the events that come into play that create this ultimate resolution that we get in the crippled god of him being freed and this is integral to that because at the very end Tavor cries out uh, Ganos uh, I've lost her I, I think that's the line I sometimes forget the exact wording but Kamensod is, is flummoxed by this 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 concept like, why is this so important he is trying to wrap his head around it. And of course, we'll, we'll get to a lot of considerations about um, love and relationships when we get to Total Hounds. But this is the beginning of that. That line by Tavor at the end that has so much weight for her, so much importance for her, is clearly an element that is so important to Tavor that Kamensod is trying to work out why. He's trying to understand these things. So we see that aspect. Another key element, I think, from, from Kamenzal's perspective, and you know, you see this in, um, in your first read, but with the chain of dogs, trying to understand how Coltian is initially perceived as barbarous, is initially perceived as this um, Wiccan, barbaric, um, heathen, uh, any sort of pejorative for an uncivilized ignorant, ill-educated savage. But by the end, he performs a noble sacrifice. He sacrifices himself. He sacrifices all of his soldiers. These people sacrifice themselves to protect innocence. When at every stage of the chain of dogs, it would have been so much easier for Coltan to cut and run. He could have done that at any stage. The pragmatic utilitarian perspective would be, is this worth the lives of all these trained soldiers? No, these, a lot of these civilians are going to die anyway. We might as well just cut our losses now, leave the sick, the elderly, the weak behind. We'll take a couple of the, the healthy ones and we'll just make a break for it. That would be the pragmatic utilitarian perspective. But that's not what Coltian does. And think then of the parallel with the bone hunters. Why do the bone hunters stick it out at the end? Why are they defending the the situation against all odds, standing up against these forces. Why don't they just cut and run? And we see that initially play out in the chain of dogs. This is the initial sort of foray that Kamensod is taking to try and understand where the bone hunters are coming from, why they do the thing that they do. He's trying to see it again by looking at these different examples that all tie in to what happens at the end. And it mightn't involve the same people, but he, he knows that the Wiccans end up being like an important aspect of Tavor's decision making in um, the Bone Hunters. And so because of that, why are the Wiccans important? Why, why does Tavor side with them over the Empire? What is going on? Where does this come from? And of course, it starts with the chain of dogs. It starts with 
the valorization of Coltane and the sacrifice that they make, the fact that they did this great and glorious thing. They sacrificed themselves to protect the innocent. They sacrificed themselves to protect the scummy nobles, people that they didn't like. But they did the right thing. They did the thing for people who resented them, people who accused them, people who thought that they were monsters, savages. They still sacrificed themselves for them. And again, we can see how that ties in, not only with the examination of the monstrous, but also trying to understand why these humans, why these mere mortals at the very end stand up to defend Kamensov. And so the chain of dogs, while it is the thrilling, I think, centerpiece of Dead House Gates for a lot of people, has that very deep connection, at least to my mind, to the crippled god and what the bone hunters go through, as well as being connected very deeply to uh, Tavor's decision making when given the offer by Lucene. And again, that ties back into the decision that uh, Lorne made in the opposite direction in Gardens of the Moon. So again, we have this continuity. We have these pieces that Kamen saw with his bigger picture is looking at and tracing out these connections, these points of connection between all of these different aspects. And so those would be the, the major elements from, from that perspective. Now, another thing I want to pick up on here is the fact that this is looking at, again, we see a lot of caring for someone. Um, a person sacrificing themselves, their lives, dedicating themselves to someone who is in some way undesirable. Felicin treats Bowden badly. Uh, Icarium is a monster. The nobles that Coltane uh, is escorting don't like him, don't care for him, are, are mean to him. Each of these different sort of storylines all emphasize that aspect. And Kamen Sod, again, ties it into, is this a human trait? Well, it can't be because he's looking at all of these, these, these conflicts involving other humans. He knows that humans are capable of great barbarism. But he's fascinated by it. He's tracing these things out. And then when we think of what he shows us, particularly in this book, about Shadow Throne and Cotillion, Shadow Throne, this Machiavellian mad, is he mad? Is he a genius? The answer, of course, is yes, uh, because he's probably both, and he doesn't know which it is at any given time. But we see in this moment, Shadow Throne saves a bunch of children. Shadow Throne, this, this Machiavellian figure who, who is shadowy, and he does all of these strange things, and he's quite cruel and malicious at times, saves a bunch of children he doesn't know. You go, well, that kind of seems out of character for what we expect to see with Shadow Throne. But is it? And is it as altruistic as it appears? It's the complexity of these things, the complexity of the motivations. Because remember, Kamen Sod intensely dislikes, if we can use that euphemism, the ascendants and the gods of this world because they they keep chaining pieces of him they keep draining his power they keep torturing him and yet he recognizes shadow throne. shadow throne was there at the last chaining the last chaining of the last piece of him that had been discovered and so he knows shadow throne and he's trying to work out who shadow throne is and he doesn't understand shadow throne and shadow throne's preoccupation with meddling in mortal affairs this blending of the divine and the mortal. Because again, Kamen Sod as a divine figure feels very much separate from his followers. He has been separated quite physically from his followers, but he existed on a different plane. And now he's seeing this world where gods and mortals intermix, where mortals become gods, that there is a fluidity to this world that maybe doesn't exist in his own. So he's trying to understand that dynamic. And we keep seeing these moments, Cotillion possessing sorry, Shadow Throne saving these children. These are moments that Kamen Sod is trying to work out. It's not Shadow Throne acting as a god and reaching down with divine power just to wave his hand and do things. He's meddling directly in these affairs. He's not necessarily always using a cat's paw. And so this is, I think, intriguing to Kamen Sod and goes to this 
I wouldn't say muddy, but the the blending of discrete spheres that we would get maybe in other fantasy worlds. There are discrete spheres, the divine and the mundane, or the divine and the mortal. But here, they continue to overlap. They continue to intermix. There are relationships between gods and mortals. Mortals become gods. Gods spend time pretending to be mortal. There's a lot of strange blending going on. And this, I think, is Kamenso trying to wrap his head around that complexity, that just as gods interfere in the mortal sphere, mortals are interfering in the divine sphere. And, you know, I think that is part and parcel of what Kamen Sod is slowly trying to build toward, toward this understanding. But anyway, I know this is a, a relatively brief look. Um, again, I hope uh, at some point that uh, there'll be other people interested in discussing the series with me uh, in this sort of frame of looking at it from the end and the reread perspective. But we'll have to see. But thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. I really do appreciate it. And I will see you in the next one.